share. And send it up there. Make sure it's using the correct mic, which it is. Okay. So I just want to say a few things about news articles while we're waiting for the official time here. And um, so this one, this one, I, I've seen this happen. The last time I saw this happen was when China hacked Google. And a year later, there was a conference of CEOs and they asked them, all right, we've been paying McAfee and everybody for firewalls. China's just hacking us like it's not even there. What's going on here? And they just lied. And you can tell when people have nothing good to say from their technical team, the sales team just makes up outrageous lies like Trump. And so they just said, oh, uh, we're going to have an AI firewall on sale within six months that will pick threats off the wire without being signature based. And everybody said, what are you talking about? And because, and so this, obviously Huawei is in this position. I mean, the Trump has threatened to ban all Huawei sales in America. They've already banned it at military bases. And apparently this is really bad for them. They've already got his daughter held in Canada for extradition for three major crimes. So he is just making up outrageous lies. So now he is saying that Huawei wouldn't spy on Americans, even if Chinese law required it. And I don't know how he can say a thing like that. How can you violate the laws in your own country? especially China. I mean, obviously, the wheels have fallen off the bus, and he's just saying anything. <laughs> well, I don't, well, I know, it's, it's, it's just, you know, how can you even, I don't understand how you can even publicly announce that you're going to violate your own country's laws. I mean, that, how can, he could probably be punished just for saying that, I would think. That's, that's nuts. Anyway, that's, I think he's obviously sinking fast. Um, Well, yeah, but I think also, well, Elon Musk got punished just for lying about the share price. And that's the point. When you're the head of a company, at least in America, you can't make outrageously false statements or it is securities fraud because you affect your stock price with these lies. I mean, I just, over here, he'd be in trouble for saying something that obviously false in public. What, uh, banning them? No, no, no. The U.S. Oh, oh well, well, I, I, I'm well. That's a very interesting statement. Have we been sabotaging the hardware? I know we have done it in targeted ways with the NSA against individual targets, but I don't think we've done it for whole product lines. Of course, of course, I don't think we've ever necessarily even admitted that we do it, but it leaked out because of Snowden. So certainly, it's true that um, in a targeted way, you'd expect this to happen. You know, in general, I think they started figuring out supply chain attacks, started getting. People started really worrying about them about five years ago. And it really is a bad idea for all your national security infrastructure to be using stuff that came from other countries. That really is a bad idea. And the more you think about it, the more bad idea it is and the more inevitable it is. Because if you consider the software in addition to the hardware, where did your uh, Python libraries come from and your Linux source code and everything, it came from all over the place and nobody really audited it. And you really got problems. You'd probably be best if you get an American commercial product like Microsoft Windows, but even that has an awful lot of stuff that came from elsewhere. It is a big issue. We're breaking up more and more to the supply chain issue, and uh, it's really appropriate to be worried about it. So we're talking about multi yeah. corporations in the UK, so we yeah. if it's a product, quote unquote, based out of the US, that corporation doesn't have any involvement to, to our country <coughs> in particular. So it's, well, that's an issue too, of course. And as, as corporations, yeah, multinational corporations, uh, this is something people worry about for a couple decades. Multinational corporations get so big that they're actually not controlled by any one nation anymore. And they can be pressured by other nations and they can make decisions that are not really to your best interest. It is a big issue. Um, anyway, so this one I thought was interesting. A lot of people want to move out of California because of the high rent. But the thing I thought is interesting is the number one concern that people have around here, more than the rent, is information security. The biggest concern is lack of privacy and data security threat tied for first place, 57% each. And that is, this, well, possibly this is the Bay Area. I think um, in, a, in a way this place is very high tech and everyone does also a lot of people here work for Facebook and related companies. And right now those companies are facing enormous trouble from this. And I think, you know, the, oh no, it doesn't. Well, it doesn't. That's why they, they asked him two questions. They asked him, you know, 
uh, how do you think of living here? Would you like to leave? And then they say, what are your biggest worries? And they say, even though they're going to leave because the housing prices is too high, that's actually not their biggest worry. It's information security, which is, I think, this is why we're facing the current madness of where we're going to have political censors of the internet, because data security has become like the new, you know, it's a, a generation ago, it was the red communists who were everywhere. We have to get rid of them. We have to, and you know, this is the, today's witch we're hunting is, is uh, free speech on the internet must be stamped out. Yeah. 50% of people moving the concerns about oh, I think they, companies, that's not, yeah. you know, except for percent of the reasons for people moving out of the Bay Area. Uh, That's no, 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 it's not. It's a different issue. But anyway, it's just, it's an interest. I just thought it was interesting how many people are so concerned about data security and privacy. So here's one. I don't, this one's kind of interesting. They, they're getting upset about the fact that password managers put your master password in RAM. And I remember I demonstrated this at Hope six years ago. Almost everything at that time put your passwords in RAM. If you went into a browser and logged into your Gmail, the password was in RAM. That doesn't do that anymore. Microsoft developed um, a data type that encrypts and deletes the contents of RAM over 10 years ago. It's in Visual Studio. There's a kind of data type you're supposed to use for secure data so it will not persist in RAM when you're done using it. But nobody bothered using it, as far as I can tell, about, until about three years ago. And apparently the password managers have not caught on yet. And so they're saying when you log in your password manager, and leave it open, the plain text password is in RAM. Now this is, at first I thought this is stupid, but now I'm thinking somewhat less so, because in order to get that, they have to have root access to your machine. But even root access to your machine does not mean they have all the passwords in your password manager. And your whole point of your password manager is it is supposed to have another barrier to prevent people, even if they can run malware in your machine, from getting the passwords. And the point of this is that doesn't work. Even the big password managers, like one passer here. So, uh, they're probably right that they all need to one pass, dash lane, key pass, and last pass. They said they all have the password there in plain text. So this would be very easy to check. It's, it's trivial to do. I did it in a forensics class and I did it on stage at Hope. I mean, you can just take an image of the process memory right from task manager and just search through it with grep or strings. It, the password is in plain text. It's just right there. So it would be fun to test. And they're right. It shouldn't be. Uh, they don't say anybody does it correctly, but we could, you know, it'd be easy enough to test. I, sh I should write it up. Um, anyway, that's an interesting thing to test. So um, I think I'll skip this stuff because we got other fish to fry. So let me tell you what's going on today because I sent an email telling you this is gay is going to have two activities. First, I want to go through the chapter, which is really very interesting. I've got two projects working with Drozer. We'll look quite a bit into Android. Then I'm going to have a non-disclosure agreement, and the people who wish to stay, I will tell you about some not some non-disclosed vulnerabilities, which are currently in the process of being disclosed and patched, and cannot be made public for a while yet. So you do not need to stay for that, and it won't affect your grade. But if anybody's interested, you can stay, and we'll talk about that. Then I'll go up to the lab and help people. Um, are there any questions about anything? So let's play with this stuff. Let me get some uh, virtual machines going. We are definitely going to need them later. And I think I'm going to start with my old one, uh, 4.3. I installed a really old virtual machine, so old that it's actually kind of hard to set up. And that will turn out to be useful for some of the attacks tonight. And so let me get my collie going, because as you probably noticed, when you don't, when you, after you connect it to VMware, you have to have VMware running to run Dynamotion. Yeah. The phone on BlueStacks? I have no idea. I've never tried to use the phones or SMS on any of them. I do know they have some degree of phone and SMS emulation, so you can test phone activity, but I haven't played with it at all. And um, uh, that's a feature. And yeah, and, and people who make phone-oriented apps do have some degree of ability to test them, although I don't think there are any emulators that connect to the real phone network. Just for the assignments, I don't know if you were specifying Google Nexus 3, but I guess the phone is a different one. I don't remember specifying anything about. Yeah, I mean, uh, as far as if you're using Jenny Motion, any version will do. Um, I used the very latest one just to see if it would work, and uh, some students had trouble and went back to Android eight or Android seven. You can even go back to like Android four or five, and everything will pretty much work. To pick any version that works, um, and uh, Jenny Motion, I mean, and BlueStacks and Knox only give you one version, and it's one they picked. And I think one of them is Android 7 and the other is Android 5. And as far as I know, they both work for most projects, but they each have various deficiencies. That's why you end up, it turns out to be useful to have several emulators because they're each 
imperfect in different ways. Good. Anyway, let me um, bring up the slides. We'll start with that, and then we'll move into demonstrations pretty quickly. Uh, this is 7A. Okay. All right. So this is the chapter I've been waiting for. This is why I switched to this textbook. textbook. I had a previous textbook, which was fine, hacking mobile applications, but then I looked at this book, and he had this Drozer thing. It's written by the people that made Drozer, and they really look inside Android in great detail with Drozer, and I said, I want to upgrade my game to that. And I'm hoping, I'm already finding outrageous vulnerabilities, even with the low type of security audits I knew how to do the last time I taught this class, and hopefully I can now start testing for these Drozer vulnerabilities, and I expect to find many more serious vulnerabilities because it's abundantly clear to me that the majority of app developers do not even understand the simple stuff that I already knew, uh, like looking to see that network traffic is encrypted, that the certificate is actually verified, and that you're not just storing stuff in plain text on the device that you shouldn't be storing there. That is, most of them don't even know that. So I think they're miles away from understanding anything we'll talk about tonight. So getting efficient at assessing this would really move our game up to a higher level. So here's the game. We're going to talk about the security model and the first part of attacking components. And the part two is just finishing attacking components. I split it up into three sections again. And part three is the rest of it, trying to cut the chapter up into three digestible chunks because these chapters are too big for you to do them in one week. And I'd really rather understand Android thoroughly and do a lot of hands-on then go through it too fast and only get the high points. So your app has got three components, and this is where all the vulnerabilities are going to come. You've got the actual phone itself, which is the app container, um, and that's the operating system and the um, sandbox and all the defenses here. Then you've got the communications channel, and then you've got the internet server, and you have vulnerabilities at all levels like crazy, of course. The app itself uh, we talked about quite a bit. You might be able to gain access to the app data by, for example, stealing the phone. Um, you might be able to put a malicious app on the device. This is incredibly easy to do. Even if you just install official apps from the Google App Store, a bunch of them are full of malware. And if I can trick you into installing anything that didn't come from the App Store, I can just modify a legitimate app. And it's very easy to trick people into putting malware on their device, just like a Windows device. Um, I mean, four years ago, I think these numbers came out. At that time, there were 100 million PC viruses and 1 million Android viruses. And at that time, I think two Mac viruses. Now, it's up to 10, one to 100 or something. But, you know, it's, um, there's lots of malware that goes in your device. So, and of course, people can just steal the device entirely. And then unless it's wholly encrypted, uh, they can get the data off it. And uh, you may have app vulnerabilities where you can inject data into an app through things like SQL injection and other defects in an app. Yeah? Quick question. Is there, I don't know if you know or anybody knows, is there a way, uh, way around the uh, Apple passcode lock or the iCloud lock? Does anybody know? Oh, yeah, they got around the iCloud lock. Uh, I don't think there is. This is, of course, how everybody steals phones. That's the whole point. This is why it's kind of funny. Uh, six years ago, you could take an iPhone and just reset it and use it. And so the number one theft in America was stealing people's iPhones. So the FBI went to Apple and they said, please make it so the iPhones that are stolen can be canceled like credit cards to end this wave of theft. So Apple locked it with this iCloud encryption. So once you've tied it to one person, you can't move it anywhere else. And then the FBI went to them and said, what did you do that for? We can't get in the phones. We seize as evidence. You've got to let us in. And Apple's like, I hate you so much. <laughs> but anyway, that's where we're at. And Apple decided... Forget it, we're locking everybody out. So as far as anybody knows, if it's locked to somebody else's iCloud, there's no way in. Even a court order at Apple will not get you in. Even the FBI can't get in. The only known way to get in is to pay a million dollars to Israeli hackers who will sell you an attack. Yeah. And nowadays, if you use a hold the knife to your throat and say, yeah. yeah, I'll delete your iCloud account. They don't care about what you got on there. They just want to resell it. Yeah. So you can use that on my iPhone. Yeah, and I think, by the way, they did achieve the FBI's original goal, which was cutting down on the iPhone theft. It's now, it used to be those curly headphones people wear, people just grab them and hunch, beat people up and steal their phones because it was like several hundred bucks right there. And uh, now I think it's really not that common. Anyway, but you're right, that's, that's a very common, once you've got a phone locked to somebody else's iCloud account, you're pretty much hosed, as far as I know. And if there was some way around it, all the crooks would steal phones again. So. Um, Anyway, it's a good question. If anybody knows a solution, let me know. But as far as I know, there's nothing resembling a free practical solution at all to this. Um, 
Anyway, so then there's communications. Once you're on the network, then the issue that your textbook brings up is getting into a privileged position to be in the middle. Um, if you're in the middle, you can then forge HTTPS certificates and fool the app if the app does not verify certificates, which I was surprised to find is almost as common in iOS apps as it is in Android apps. Um, so these are ways to get in the middle. You can just run the wireless network, compromise, and if you can compromise an upstream provider, like the ISP or the server at the other end, then of course you can get in the middle and intercept and modify traffic. Um, so the, the communications are a weak spot, and the servers are a very weak spot. And in fact, I mean, I've had students that say, I'm safe because I don't use online banking. I say, well, you know, you have reduced one risk, but that is not the main risk. People don't steal credit card numbers one at a time from individual people with man in the middle attacks. That is for punks. What they do is hack into the bank server and steal a whole database. And the problem is, even if you do all your banking by writing with a pen on paper, they type it into a computer at the bank. And so, your main risk is still there, and all you're doing is like patching the small risk. And I realized from the studies I've done last week that this is what I was wrong about iOS. I thought iOS is much safer than Android because the operating system is much more secure, but that doesn't really matter. The primary risk is the app, and iOS apps are just as miserable as Android apps. I'll have statistics coming up later. I hadn't anticipated this, but now that I finally got a good iOS auditing system, I found appalling stuff in iOS apps. So as far as I can tell, you have at least a 10% chance for every app of doing something mind-numbingly stupid, like plain text authentication over the internet, or something even stupider for both Android and iOS. And if you don't know how to audit the app, obviously this is happening because the developers, the managers, and the customers do not know how to audit the app for even the simplest problem, so they'll just blithely have millions of people using something that's doing something incredibly stupid and nobody notices. So we really need to like have more people understand how to do simple security tests to raise the game here. Yeah. Well, um, the iPhone has certain security advantages, but as far as an end user is concerned, I think they are about equal because the things, the iPhone has improved the operating system, but this is what happened to Windows, right? Microsoft Windows, the operating system used to be very vulnerable, 98 and 2000 and, X, and XP, and Microsoft wised up and they hardened it. So the operating system got much more secure, but it didn't make the customers safer because people switched to things like social engineering. So it's the same thing. Your iPhone OS is really very good, but it doesn't save you from what's wrong with your app. So this is true. Like you can have cryptography that's very good, but it doesn't do you any good if you fall for social engineering. It's, it's, it's Anyway, so um, we don't talk about the security model. The Android security model is very strange. Like the one thing that we talked about in previous classes is the idea that it will let anybody sign any app. That is kind of screwy, and I, I still don't quite understand what they're thinking there, but that's their freedom model. I think it all comes from this sort of Linux idea that nobody should have to like get permission or pay anything to put up an app. And uh, I don't know, Google is getting more and more corporate, more and more like Microsoft and Oracle. I think one of these days they're gonna just switch to less freedom and more control, where which has the benefit that you can, you can have more security in addition to taking more money out of the system, but still, they're on the open source plan. Everything should just be open and uncontrolled, and uh, that does lead to certain problems. So here's one that is interesting. I, in, I, this one I kind of understand. In the early versions of Android, up until I think about 4.1, which is API 17, um, there are four components to an Android app. We talked about this before. There are activities, which are the screens you see on the device. There are broadcast receivers, which receive information from other apps on the phone. There are services that run and provide a service of some kind. And there are content providers, which are databases. Now, the logical way you use an app is you get some kind of data. And if you have a content provider, that means you have some kind of database, storing data. So you would store data in the database. And obviously, you probably intend for other apps to see that data. That's why you'd put it in a database. So by default, it exports those. It makes them available to other apps. That was the default condition. And then, of course, what people did was with passwords and all sorts of secrets and private photos and everything in the content provider. And then they said, we probably shouldn't have just exported that to every other app on the phone by default. So they switched to exporting nothing by default. But um, anyway, I can see the logic that would lead to this. This storing your database, they assume, probably means you're trying to share something with some other app. But it doesn't necessarily mean that. You might just have a lot of data to store that you want to search through, but you don't really want to share it with another app. So 
It's this is what happened to Amazon. This happened to Microsoft with SQL Server. This happened to Mongo. Many, many people made database products that were wide open to the world by default. And they said, this is the easiest way to configure it. And they, everybody keeps making the same mistake. Amazon did it recently with their open EC2 buckets. You put your stuff in the cloud, the EC2 database buckets are just sitting there wide open to the whole world. And people don't know that, so just an endless train of breaches. Microsoft did it with SQL Server. In two, up until 2005, SQL Server would install with a default password, well, SA, by default. So people would just use that, and then they wonder how their data got stolen. It keeps on happening over and over again. People start out by saying, well, let's make the database available to everyone. That seems like the thing to do. And then only later they say, oh, maybe we do need to have a barrier around that. So, um, so going on in your app, there are three... Um, versions, numbers used in your app. There's the compile SDK version, which is which version of the compiling software you use to make the app. There's the minimum SDK version, which determines how modern a phone has to be. And there's the target SDK version, which is the version you recommend for your app. Um, so the minimum SDK version is what leads to this irritating message I see when I'm trying to test apps that says, I cannot put this app on your phone. That's annoying. That's why I have so many emulators, trying to find something I can put the app on. Um, but anyway, the uh, target SDK is what determines whether it's going to have that default permission behavior or not. Um, so then the next question that logically comes to mind is, should I target a modern version of Android and move my minimum to a modern version of Android? And then, of course, the question is, how many people are using old versions of Android? So I can make a business decision. If it's only like, like how, if you might make an app, you probably don't want to support Windows 95 anymore because you can be easily discover that less than 1% of Americans are using Windows 95. So unless you're in another country, you really, it's not sensible to support that product. So the question is, how many people are using modern versions of Android? Now, it used to be that only 1% of Android phones were using the latest version. It was amazing. Almost everybody was using Android 4.0 or earlier last time I taught this class, like 70% of phones. Now, Android is up to um, Lollipop or Soy Marshmallow new versions, and the new versions are Nougat and Oreo, the new versions, and they're almost half the market. KitKat is the biggest four, and it's getting down to a small wedge, so it looks pretty good. Um, Android is much more modern than it used to be. However, um, something really drastic is happening in the phone industry. And it's kind of a fun little note here saying, data, this is data collected in the latest seven days. Up to October 26, 2018, when they say, oh, we're updating the servers. We'll update this pretty soon. Well, it's getting to be a long time since then. This is, of course, a lie. And that's why I say I observe Google getting more and more corporate. Now they just lie, shamelessly, like other companies. They are not having a technical update here. What happened is phones are not selling anymore. There's a big scandal. Apple iPhones are not selling like they used to, and Android phones are not selling like they used to, and they are trying to conceal this to keep their stock price up. And app, they both Android, both Google and iOS have now ceased reporting their sales numbers. This is a really bad sign. I would be really worried when companies say, we're going to stop issuing financial reports, and by the way, buy some more stock. Say, Wait a minute. They're, they're ashamed of their sales, and instead of admitting it, and explaining it, they're trying to pretend it's not happening, which is shockingly dishonest and you know, I expect out of corporate companies, big companies where pressures force them to do things. So people say it's getting to be a long time. People are arguing about this. They're saying it's ugly and they're hiding it. Um, many people say that the new Androids and the new iPhones are both overpriced. There's not enough new features and they're trying to conceal. I think a lot of companies this way. Twitter has also greatly resisted reporting their numbers because their numbers are not much good. Facebook is also in big trouble for the numbers, not only because of the political problem, but Facebook is up to like 3 billion users. Now, there aren't very many more humans on the planet. You can't keep growing very far when half the humans on the planet are using your product, but they're trying to pretend they're going to keep growing. And I don't know how long. I don't know, I'm a physicist, right? I think in terms of simple like charts, when you hit the population of the planet, I would say you have to stop growing, you know? <laughs> but anyway, uh, so... So here's, so you can, that's the default condition that things are exported. Now you can specify in the, um, the Android manifest file, you can say this is a receiver and it's exported, which means it's available in other apps. And that's fine. If you don't specify it, then it will make that default choice. And if your target SDK is less than 17, it will export it if it is a content provider and not otherwise. Uh, you can also have implicitly exported. If you specify an intent filter, that means you're specifying what kind of requests I wish to take from other apps, and therefore, obviously, you intend for it to be exported. So even if you don't explicitly, 
ask for it to be exported, it interprets this as obviously you intend to export it. Yeah. If, if, if you have, you have a uh, feature of your app and it is exported, that means you can send data to that part of the app from another app on the phone. So some apps are totally self-contained and all they do is interact with the user. But other apps expect to get data from other apps on the phone. Like, um, for example, you might be taking a picture in the camera app and then you want to save it in like a photo album. And then you want to export it to like uh, Picasa or something. So you want to take the data out of your app and send it to some other app. So that other app would have to have an intent filter that accepts data from someone else. And that's what's going on, of course. You're passing data from app to app on the phone. And remember, with the Android sandbox, every app runs in a different user identity. So sending it from one app to another is like emailing from one person to another. They have to cross the security boundary there. So you, it's only done to the extent to which you allow that. This is just like Windows or anything else. You, might, you can turn on a share folder and share your files with somebody else. But if you don't do that, nobody can see your files. That's the idea. So you can find these components. If you run Drozer, you can run this thing called Attack Surface, which is really very nice. And it just goes through all the components of your app. All it does, I think, is scan the manifest file, looks at the activities, broadcast, content providers, and services, and tells you how many of them are exported. This is your simple attack surface. These are all the ways another app can send data into your app. And this is the obvious attack surface. Now you want to, the first thing you want to look at is if any of these things are important or dangerous or not controlled. This is very much like the Windows, um, the API calls for Facebook and the Windows um, remote procedure calls. In Linux and Android, remote procedure calls are where one app gets to call another app and request service and they lead to almost all the famous worms and viruses are from RPG vulnerabilities. It is the most common flaw that your app is offering a service to another app and it forgets to worry about malicious content from the other app. And there is some way to trick one app into sending some kind of malicious com information to the other app. This happens all the time on all of your operating systems and probably on Android too. That is what I would like to find out. I mean, now I finally, for the first time, I have a tool to see this. And I expect to find that it is the same horrible nightmare that it has been on Windows and Linux, but I don't know that for sure yet. But I do know on Windows, this process turned out to be incredibly fouled up and dangerous. So here's how we're going to do it. So you can, you can then run more specific ones. This just told me, um, for example, I'm, this is the Android browser, the example they use in your book, which is just an app written by Google that's on every phone. So you can easily, you don't have to install anything to test it. So the Android browser has various activities exported. And so I can find, I can look at those broadcast providers and get more information about them. And I will see here are the things that are exported. It has something called bookmark thumbnail widget provider, something called open download receiver, account change receiver, and preload request receiver. So those are functions which can be launched from some other app. So, and notice permissions null means that there is no limitation on who can do that. Anybody can send data to that provider. This one here requires a certain permission. So they'll have to have com Android browser permission preload. They'll have to have that permission in order to send data to this thing, which I think is just guessing from the name. I think what's going on here is you can click on downloads in your Android phone and then a little down arrow will appear in the corner and it'll keep on downloading in the background, just like it does in the Firefox browser. You start downloading, it just piles. I think that's what's going on here. And only certain people are allowed to add things to that list. So they'll download because that has been a, a uh, drive-by download vulnerability has been there in Safari and many other browsers where a page can download stuff and you don't get a pop-up warning you. So um, they, but these, anybody can do account change, open download receiver and bookmark thumbnail. I think that's so somebody can put a bookmark in from some other app. Uh, you have some kind of link that says bookmark this page or something, the help page for my app or something. So I'm guessing. I don't know exactly, but that's what I would expect. You have certain things that it's okay for some other app to ask for and some things that are kind of dangerous and you want to make sure that they have some permission. You considered whether you really want to let them access that part of your app. Then there are intent filters. You can do, um, if you use minus I, it will show you much more information about the specific actions that you can do here. So notification click, login accounts changed, preload. That's why Drozer is very nice. It makes it very easy to see exactly what can be accessed within my app 
and even it makes it very easy to generate basically malware that will do these attacks. We'll play with that in future projects. So, um, of course, remember that all of this is only controlled by the sandbox, which is just the Linux permission model. If you are root, you can access every part of every app, obviously. It's something to be aware of. It is not, this is the same thing true on Windows and on Linux. If you are root, you can go into everybody's account. So we are, if you were able to gain root on the phone, then all this is gone. This is only a security um, analysis for what you can do by just getting someone to put a normal app on the phone. And what could, and if, if they can access things that are exported with no permission, they do not need root privileges to do that. All right. Anyway, um, now there are permission protection levels. We talked about them last time. There are general categories of how important a permission is. And you can choose how what protection level to assign to your permission. And what they said last time is if you're writing an app and you're not sure, just make everything signature. Then nobody can access it except other apps signed with your signature. So it's only going to be other apps that you write that talk to that. And that should be your default thing. Um, so this led to the provision level downgrade attack, which is bloody awesome. And that's why I got that old phone so I can show you this working. They fixed this in Android 5. But I can do it in my Android 4.3 phone. And it is pretty awesome. And here's how it works. A, it most, like most really great attacks, it's not a bug. It is a logic flaw. Like if you look at Dan Kaminsky's DNS attack and any of the really great acts, you're not a bug in line of code anymore. It's just that if you obey the protocol as specified, something bad happens. And here's what happens. If I'm an app, I can assign permissions to my app, and then it will pop up a box when you install it. Is it okay if your app has access to the phone and access to the camera and the network and this and that? You say yes. But I can also define a new permission. Everybody does. You do it all the time. Skype has its permissions. Everybody finds a few new permissions. Well, what, what happens is, what if one app defines a permission, and then you later on put another app that tries to define the same permission? Until Android 5, the second app would just silently do nothing and accept the permission level assigned by the previous app. So all you had to do is make a malicious app that predefines the permissions that other apps are going to put on, and it will make them wide open. And when you install the other app, they'll now be wide open. It's really pretty awesome. And it resembles the other flaws we talked about last time, like the um, signature flaw, where you can have signed code and just add another file at the end with the same name, and it will not notice. And the signature will pass, and it'll put on the file, and then it'll put on the other file and overwrite it. So you end up with the file that didn't pass the test. And this is a natural consequence of modular code and modular design where one part of it tests the security and says, okay, it's good. The next part opens it and puts it all in without really knowing how much it should have gotten. It's, and so it installs the app. It tries to define the permission. It just says, oh, that permission's already here. Okay, well, then don't define it and just carry on. Let's not worry about that. They must have defined, must have installed the previous version or something. And so that's pretty awesome. So anyway, we'll play with that one. And um, all right. So we're going to do this section. But I think, let me see where I am on my time here. I think it's not too late yet. No, let's take a look at this uh, chat message. Will you share those info on Saturday? Um, I don't know. Uh, I've talked about secret stuff. Uh, anyway, so the, um, I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, let me just go through this. I've got a project for this, and I think it's good to do it. Um, so you see this stuff in action. I've got my Android device here, and I've got to start my old phone. Okay, so here's my old phone, and I've got Kali running uh, here. Okay, and I should have some, good, I've got some shells going in there, so let's get out of drawers. Oh, I didn't mean to edge it to connection, let me get back in. Okay, so I'm in Kali here, and I've just started my phone. And I might as well show you a few new tricks, which I'm putting in my more recent projects. Because um, a lot of phones make it hard to find your IP address. And I got fed up enough with this. I said, you know, we're doing hacking costs. You don't need to look and find out an IP address. The way you find an IP address is net discovery. So let's get over it. So do IP address. This is my calling machine. And I have an address right here, 172.16.123. And I can even take that just the way it is, even the specific address with the slash 24. And I just do net discover minus R that. And this will scan that subnet with ARP and find every device on that subnet. And it's very fast. 
and it asks me to give it permissions, which it doesn't really need here. You see, it's already done. So it scanned my subnet, and it's found all the devices on my subnet. Three of them are VMware, and one is not. That's the Android. That's all I need to know. The one that is not a VMware product is the Android product, and it just depends on which emulator you have, what it says here, but I don't care. Now I know the IP address of my Android. This is a lot better than hunting through the stupid settings and trying to find the stinking address. What's that? What's discover IP address minus R? Yeah, net, yeah it's net discover minus R and just the IP address, and you can put a slice 24 on it. And it'll do the whole range. So it's really very nice. And, and that's what you do all the time in all our pen testing activities. Anyways, that's a good start. So now that I've got the address, I can do ADB connect to that address. Now I'm in. So now I have a connection to the device. Now, um, I want to um, remove some apps from this device. I'm going to take a look here and see if I have Twitter. Um, I put Twitter on, but I think I might have taken it off again. I don't remember if I got it on anymore or not. I do have Twitter on the phone. All right, well, let me take off Twitter. Now, I, I guess I can do it different ways. I'm going to do it from command line. So let me bring up the, the project that goes with this, which is the very latest project, 16. All right, this is the protection level downgrade attack, which is good, clean fun. So I've already put a Drozier agent on the phone, and I've already put a Twitter app on the phone. So I've done quite a bit of this project, and now I'm going to basically go down here and uninstall that stuff. So the Drozier agent is com.mwr.dz. That's the official name of the Drozer app. So you can remove it in Android Debug Bridge with ADB uninstall. That will take off the Drozer agent. And Twitter is com.twitter.android. So I'll take that off too. Okay, so now I don't have the Drozer agent or Twitter on the phone. Now, the um, if I install Twitter in, say, Google Play here and get the original Twitter, I can see the permissions in Twitter. So let's put that in, fresh from the store. Remember, like I say, you have to accept all these permissions. So these are all those permissions. These are general categories that include a bunch of those little atomic permissions. So I give it all the permissions, and it's going to put that on. It's also got a play protect thing that comes on, which is another Google security feature to try to detect if it's malicious, which doesn't appear to do any good at all. But anyway, it may stop something. It's not stopping any attacks I've tried so far. Um, we are going to, a student, one of the students did work out how to use Metasploit to make poison APKs and put malware on the phone, and that would be awesome. And maybe it would stop that. You would think the antivirus products could at least stop Metasploit. I'll add that when I get around to it. Student got it working. I just need to write it up. Anyway, so now I've got Twitter on the phone. Now I could run it, but I don't even care about running it. I just want to analyze the Twitter app. So let's use Drozer. Now, in order to use Drozer, I need to put a Drozer agent on the phone. And uh, I think we talked about this before. Um, all you have to do is download the Drozer agent from the peop from your textbook author, really. Um, you download it with wget from the GitHub where they made it, and then you install it with ADB install. I've already put it on my Kali, so if I go into APK Drozer, it should be in here. Yeah, there it is, Drozer agent 234. So all I gotta do is ADB install Drozer. And that'll put that agent on the phone. Okay. And that now that and just goes on quickly in success. Now I need to run it because I want to investigate apps on the phone from this app. So this is basically a remote control sort of like team viewer that I'm putting on the phone. So I go, um, there's Twitter. If I go in here, there's Drozer. So let's put that on my desktop and run the Drozer agent. And it's off right now. I need to turn it on. Now the Drozer agent is listening for commands from the command and control center. And now I can tell the Drozer agent to do things to my phone. And so um, the only thing I, remaining trick is I have to forward the ports because the Drozer agent is listening on the phone on port 31415 and I need it to be listening on Kali. So this is what ADB forward does. It moves traffic from the port on the Android phone to the Kali. So now, I can connect here, and now I can run Drozer. And so let's play some games with Drozer, um, which is going to be here. So to launch uh, Drozer, it's Drozer Console Connect. All 
All right, and there it gives me my Metasploit-like banner, and I'm ready to run Drozer. And now I can do things. So let's go back to the slides, for example, and start with a couple things from there. Um, back here, we were doing, uh, yeah, run app package attack surface. I thought this is pretty fun. So app package attack surface is what gives you a summary of the uh, vulnerable parts of an app. So let's do that run app dot package, right? Dot package dot attack surface. Attack surface, okay. And now I need to give it the name of my app. And the name of my app is com Android Twitter, I think. Um, no, com Twitter Android, okay, good. Com. Dot Twitter, dot Android. Okay, so Twitter has nine activities, eight broadcast receivers, two content providers, and five services exported. It's got lots of things going on. Okay. Um, no yeah. How do you find the, the app name on Oh, um, you can do it a lot of ways. You can do it right with ADB. Um, let me just open another window here. I already have one open. Good. Okay. And I should be able to connect here. Okay. Uh, we've done that before when we're taking apps off the phone. It's, AD, for, it's ADB shell PM list packages is one way to do it. Right, that's all. That's one way to do it. Another thing, by the way, sometimes the name of the package is really not obvious. It's not equal to the name of the app or anything. So what I've done in that case is I've launched it and just look in the process list for what just got launched. You can do that ADB shell and then do PS and this shows you all the running processes. And so what you can do is run PS and then launch the app and run PS again and compare them when you really get fed up with trying to figure it out. Cause sometimes it has a goofy name, which is like an abbreviation of the app developer and not related to the name of the app at all. Um, also when you install them, they get new user accounts and user accounts just count up. So you can see here it's 61, 16, 11. So the latest one you install will have the highest number here. Another thing you can do, by the way, is you can look here in data, data. And here, every app has its own directory, which is named after the app. And I think you can get um, date stamps here. So if you install the app fresh, you can look for current dates here. You can look for the highest number here. So there's actually a lot of cool ways to do it. And by the way, there's another one. You can go to the Google Play Store online and get the official name of the app from the URL there. So I've done all these things when testing apps. Uh, it can be annoying to get the right name of an app. But most of them, give it a nice simple name that's just simply related to the name of the app. So now that I've done that, I've seen the exported services. So the next thing I'd like to do is see the permissions. And so I can do that with app package info. So let me run this one. This will show me the permissions. Now, here are the permissions in that Twitter app. Now, remember when I installed the Twitter app, it brought up a box and said, you're going to give it like these six or eight things. And those six or eight things like access to the network, access to the microphone, access to the camera, each one of those are like three or four other things like vibrate and read contacts and get accounts. These are all the permissions it used. Now, these are permissions that were already on the phone that Android defined. So these are just using permissions that exist. So that's not what I'm particularly interested in right now. That's just the same thing that showed the user. What I'm interested in here are the new permissions that the Twitter app defined, and there are four of them. These are things that didn't exist, and that's why they're named after Twitter. They're not named after Android or Sony or anything that put that stuff on the phone. So here I've got something called read data restricted, off app, and C2D message. These are things that the Twitter app defined. So I would like to know, and at the end, I only saw three before. I don't know what's happening, but I'm not going to worry about the details. These three are the ones I analyzed before. So you can now find out um, about these permissions. So here is one way to learn about the compounds. There's a tax service. We've already done this with eight activities and so on. We can now look at them one by one. So the eight activities, I can look at the information about the activities with this command, and it will show me what activity, more details about the activities. And what I see is, there, here's the activities, and one of these is off app, which is one of those newly defined permissions. And I can see that that permission is needed in order to do this thing, authorize app activity. 
So that's what it does. It lets you run something called the authorized app activity, and that is something, an activity, something you would see. I would imagine um, what this is. Remember, you can authorize some other service to use your Twitter account, like uh, find out how popular I am and stuff like that. I think that's probably what this is. Authorizing some other app to use your Twitter account. That's probably what this is. But anyway, they need to find a new permission, and that's where it goes. The other activities aren't there because the other permissions are not activities. The restricted permission is here on broadcast. So if I do broadcast info, I see um, the restricted one here. So restricted is the thing that goes to app broadcast receiver. And I don't really know what it is. I think it might be putting a tweet on your tweet stream, but I'm not sure. Anyway, there's some kind of activity. And so I get more information about what these newly defined permissions do. Anyway, that's that, now I can check the protection level of those permissions. Remember, permissions are sorted into categories like signature and dangerous and normal. And I can run this command to see what those permission levels are. So there it is for those three apps. And so this app, read data, is signature. Restricted is signature. And auth app is dangerous, which is even more restrictive than signature. Um, those are the categories of permission level. And the point is, um, what I would like to do is to change those permission levels. And that turns out to be incredibly easy to do. So what I have to do is I have to get Twitter off the phone and install a different app that will define these permissions as normal before I reinstall Twitter. So I have to make an app. This turns out to be very easy in Drozer. <laughs> By the way, in order to run Drozer, you have to downgrade Java and your colleague just to drive us all. Java, as far as I can tell, is just a cruel act of sadism against the world. Java always makes you suffer greatly. And you always have the wrong version. It's never installed right. The path is always wrong. It's, anyway, so you can't run Java. You can't run Drozer, this function of Drozer, on a modern Kali machine. You have to downgrade Java back to Java 8. But anyway, I found the commands and you can do it. Once you've done that, you can now make a Java app. And so I'm going to go down here and make the, this is the app that does, this is the command that builds another Drozer agent. The same, it has the same functionality as the Drozer agent I'm using now, but it's going to define these extra permissions. You're going to define these Twitter permissions, and then it's going to set them as normal instead of like dangerous and signature. Now, if you were to ask me, I would say, why in the world is Drozer allowed to define a Twitter permission? But Android doesn't seem to worry about that, at least not in this version of Android. So you can run this. This will build the Drozer agent that defines the Twitter permission. So I have to get out of here and then run it from here. And there it goes. It's very much like what we've done in our other reverse engineering where we take apart an app like Bank of America, modify it, and then recompile it. It's recompiling it with something like APK tool and then signing it, and it made it here. Temp, give it a random temp name. Yeah. Yes, we will. In order for this to work, we have to remove Twitter and Drozer because this is a modified. I haven't installed it. I've just made it, so it's here. That's right. So the next thing I have to do is get Twitter and Drozer off the phone. So uh, that is down here. Um, to remove, here's, this will take Twitter and Drozer off the phone because I certainly don't want the old versions of them. So this will take away Drozer and that'll take away Twitter. Now I install the new modified Drozer, which is here, which is ADB install that. Okay, and now I could check to see if it's working. I could check the permissions of Drozer. I didn't put this in the project, but it's kind of fun. So if I run um, connect back into Drozer with Drozer console connect, um, um, oh, that's right. I can't connect because the agent has stopped because I took the agent off the phone. Obviously, I have to run the agent again because I took it off and reinstalled it. So here's the agent. I got to run it. And on top of that, I got to run the port forwarding again because the port is gone. So I learned finally what everyone else in the world knew about Linux. You can press Control R and hunt for old commands. So I can look for the forward command, and there it is. And now I can do the um, Drozer console connect. Okay, now I'm back in Drozer. And now to see permissions, there were three long commands up here that would show me those Twitter permissions. And there they are. So let's take a look and see what the status of those three permissions is now. 
and now they are all normal, 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 instead of signature, signature, dangerous, because they were not put there by Twitter, they were put there by the Drozer app. So now, what happens when I put Twitter on top of it? Right from the Play Store again. Come on, stop. Oh, I got to hit this? Okay, fine. Right. I had Twitter. Come on, here, Twitter. Okay, there we are. Okay. Like before, I think now hopefully that's more clear what he's doing here. Those 15 or 20 things we saw, I just agreed to them. And off it goes. Yes, you would. Yeah, what it's doing is something dumb. Like just say, oh, it's already there. Well, then I don't need to do it. So I'll just go on. Yeah. Exactly. What's the, they patched it in version five. And that what they did was it will not install Twitter after this. It'll say another app is contradicting Twitter. You have to move it first, which is actually not a bad solution. It will refuse to install a new thing that tries to define a permission that's already there. It stops and asks you, wait a minute, something's wrong here. That's not a bad idea, I guess. But anyway, so um, now if I run these uh, commands again, it's still normal. So Twitter is now running with no longer protection on these permissions. This is actually pretty awesome. And so this, there was a vulnerability like this in Windows 2000 that was really awesome. All you had to do was share a folder. You could have a folder with no permissions to enter this folder, and you could share a subfolder, and everybody could just sail right in. It was bloody awesome. The sharing permissions could go right past the NTFS permissions. There's, there's a, a group policy control called bypass traverse checking to prevent that, and it's turned off by default. So we need, this kind of thing happens in every operating system in a variety of ways. So anyway, that's the demonstration I wanted to show you of this. And we got a little more of this lecture, but I think we ought to take like a 10 minute break and pick up at five after seven, uh, so you can stretch your legs. We got more of this chapter to do, and then I have an extra thing, of course. And I need to go upstairs and copy my NDA because there's more people that showed up than I expected. I'm gonna pause the recording, but it'll stay live. All right. Well, let's pick up again. Um, so, all right, folks. Let's, let's pick up again. So, we got. So, let's talk about the components. So, we're going to go into more detail about these components that we talked about before. And the main thing here is intents. Intents are the signals, like API calls, that you find in, say, Facebook or the Microsoft operating system, where you send some kind of request to a server to do something for you. Like in Microsoft, this is how you save a file on a disk. You send a call to the function that puts the file on the disk because user land applications do not have authority to talk directly to the hardware. They have to pass it to kernel routines. So intents are the data objects that tell one app, tells another app to do something. So you can start an activity with start activity and send broadcast to go to a broadcast receiver and you can start a service. And those of course will only work if those services and activities and everything have been exported. And if you pass through the filter, which specifies what sort of uh, requests I will allow in. The intent itself does not necessarily specify where it's going. So for example, you might be in some kind of app and then you decide to add a picture like to your profile in something like Twitter. And then you say, pick photo. So it goes and launches a photo album app and you pick the picture and then it sends it back. So you have an intent going to the other app to launch the app and then you have an intent coming back to return the photo back to this app. And that's how your apps cooperate. So uh, if you want to start another activity by an intent, this is how it looks in, I think, Java. You just define an intent, and then you give it a class, and then you start the activity based on the intent. Um, that's, that's what it looks like. You're writing the code. So you can have explicit contents. Explicit intents tell it where it should go. It included in your code, you tell it exactly who I'm trying to send this intent to. And that would be fine, but usually you can only do this if you're sending it to another part of your own app, because otherwise you do not know what's installed on the phone. So you cannot name exactly what to send it to. So what you typically send is an implicit intent, like that thing before there, where you say, click here to add a profile to my page, a picture to my page. It probably doesn't know which picture app you're using. You might have some other picture app installed. So it will send an intent that says something like play this MP3. It'll say, see if I have a player 
And if there's more than one, it'll probably pop up a box and ask the user, which one do you want to use? Because all it knows is I want a picture or an MP3 or something, and it's up to some other app to cough that up. So the, here's an example. Here's one that you should do all the time. And I remember when this, years ago when I started teaching Windows tech support, I was amazed. You could just open like a command prompt, and you could type www.yahoo.com, and it would open the browser. And I wondered, how did it do that? How does it know? what app to launch just from the name of something and that is a huge issue on all operating systems and it's been going around for decades and that's the issue you do something like i want to open a url something.com how do i do it and there's no simple answer but it has um, your operating system has a list of approved handlers for that kind of request and it will guess it will try to find all the installed web browsers will have intent filters accepting urls and it will then uh, decide which one of them to send it to, either by some kind of internal logic or by asking the user. If you use Microsoft Windows, there's a huge issue that led to the lawsuit against Microsoft Windows in Windows 98 of which one is the default. If you type a URL, which browser launches? Microsoft tried to make it always Internet Explorer and they got sued for antitrust. And they were forced in Windows XP Service Pack 1 to make an option so you could easily choose non-Microsoft default apps. And Android has, of course, the same issue. You might very well have multiple browsers, and how does it know which one to use and which one is the default? So you can specify in your app intent filters, saying what kind of requests would I like to handle? I'll offer to handle requests for images, requests for telephone calls, requests for SMS messages, whatever you want. You have to specify an action. These other things are optional. And you can now have filters. You can filter by scheme, just the part before the colon slash slash, in a request, uh, this, these custom uh, schemes are commonly used. They're also used in Windows and in the Mac OS, and they lead to an endless chain of entertaining vulnerabilities in Windows. There are like a dozen really old ones that are never used anymore, like Gopher and uh, stupid things like that, and they're still floating around and people don't really have apps installed, so you can actually steal them and do bad things with them. Anyway, so you define a scheme here, you can, um, Look at the host, which is the name of the company, www.google.com. You can look for the port number. If you have a URL that has a port number on it, you can refer to the path, and then it will just take the entire re request and do like a grep search for any text inside there. So you can look. This is what happened to make a whole category of PHP vulnerabilities on web servers. Apache configuration files use this technique. So what most people do when they configure a PHP and Apache is any file with PHP anywhere in the file name is interpreted as active code and executed. So you can actually trick it into running stuff that was not supposed to be executable, depending if they make this mistake, which is fairly common, um, that you incorrectly match the whole path when you really meant to do something like just match the file name extension. And then you can specify MIME types for other types of data flying around like those uh, images and songs. So anyway, you got an activity manager, AM, this is a part of Android and you can launch it in the command line and you can generate intent. So you can do ADD shell AM and then you can start an intent and send off Android intent action and activate the view. That's one way to do it. So you don't even need to add any special code. You can generate intents. And here's the start of the long documentation page for AM. AM has many, many options. You can define any kind of intent you want this way. Uh, you don't need to write your own app, but you can easily do it with Drozer. And so in Drozer, the first, the Project 10, they're not exactly in order, but I mean, Project 10 is where you set up the SIV as a vulnerable password manager. It's a special app just to test it. Like I say, most of the time we're using real apps, but there's a few times I'm actually using the fake apps that other people use. Hopefully by next semester, next time I teach this class, I'll have a bunch of real companies apps we can use instead. But this is the first time I've done this intense stuff, so I'm actually doing like the textbook stuff. However, you're not suffering as much as my first students did because we used, tried to use, the first time I taught this, we used a fake app and it totally didn't work. It was miserable to install, crashed all the time. Civ works pretty well. So Civ is a deliberately vulnerable password manager. You can put store passwords in this thing and then you can steal them because it's not designed right. So if you do the attack surface, you'll see exported activities, content providers, and services. And if you look at the activities information, you'll see that there's something called file select, main login, and PW list. And all of them have no permissions required at all. So anybody at any time can launch these activities and activities are pages you can see. So you can launch this thing called PW list from the Drozer app or from any other app. And if you do, 
you just run the activity, then it launches up this page and shows you the usernames. You don't get the passwords yet, but you do get the usernames. You want passwords are stored, so that's rude. It's supposed to have a PIN or a password required to get to this page, but by exporting the activity without any permissions, you can jump right to it. Um, then, um, here's another fun fact. If you look in the Civ app, it has at the providers. Remember there were two or three providers exported? Well, there's a path to slash keys, and the slash keys has a bunch of permissions you have to have, read keys and write keys, but it's the only path that has any permissions. Other paths do not have any permissions. So there's a, if you go back to this thing and do find URLs, there is a Drozer module that will scan through it looking for what look like intents, where they have a scheme colon slash slash something. So it finds, they start with content. That's not a perfect way to find all the possible URLs that will be treated as intents, but it finds some of them. Here you find there's some places where you sent call keys and then passwords and then passwords with a slash. And the only one of these three that actually requires permissions is keys. You can directly refer to the passwords without passing through any stage that requires permissions. So if you do that, you get something that's a password. However, like in the Android apps that I've studied, like in real companies like Home Depot, it's encrypted. It's encrypted in base 64. And so you've got something that is really none of your business, but you haven't really got the pot of gold yet. You've got a encrypted password. So that's something. And then um, to get the whole story, you have to do SQL injection. You can, when you query the content provider, the content provider is almost always a SQL-like database. And if they don't filter the intents, it's vulnerable to SQL injection by intents, just like anything else. So I can send it a, um, a query and I can send it a uh, apostrophe for the query. So it has an extra apostrophe and then you get this error unrecognized token while compiling, select star from passwords where apostrophe. Missing the matching apostrophe. It's a slightly different syntax of error, but it's the same thing as the SQL syntax error that we see in like web apps with SQL injection. So that means all you have to do is write a more careful one. And here you do um, star from SQLite master where type equals table semicolon dash dash. This should look relatively familiar. It's a small modification of the kind of injection we use in other SQL. And this gives you the names of the tables. And you can find a table name passwords. And you can send the correct query, which will do star from key. So I'm going to give you the plain text master password. So it's pretty awesome and uh, kind of nice. And what would be even more fun is if we had real apps with these vulnerabilities, not fake apps. And I'm hoping it won't be long to find them. So anyway, here's real world examples from the past of similar vulnerabilities. Um, if you have a, a phone, your phone is supposed to lock, right? And you're not supposed to be able to get in without putting the pin. You have to put in the pin and then you get there. Well, not really. Um, it turned out that the action that unlocked the screen was not protected. So all you had to do was to send an intent that said unlock the screen and it will go there without asking you for the pin. <laughs> So if you have a malicious app on the phone, you can just bypass that. Uh, that's what got good clean fun. And then there's tap jacking. This is very much like click jacking. It turns out the reason why click jacking works in web pages is you can have transparent components that lay on top of something. So you click on something and you're actually clicking on an invisible thing you can't see. You can do the same thing in Android. There's something called um, toasts which are extra graphic elements that float on a page. And you can define a toast that floats on top of the page so you can be in some app and there's like a thing here called accept that I want you to click. And what I show you is this and say, pop the balloon and bring, 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 bring bitcoins or something. And when you click on this, you're actually clicking on that. So the same, the same thing is what they call click jacking in Windows. It is principle being done on Android. Um, then here's another one. Um, this is one that I heard about years ago on iOS and I haven't researched it much lately, but it's been one thing that you know, iOS, uh, when you close an app, it doesn't just turn off, it shrinks down to the corner. In order to do that, it has to store an image of your last page and then modify the image. And it's storing those somewhere on the phone. So if someone were to steal them, they would have screenshots of your app. And those are also true of this. If you hit the square button at the bottom of your Android emulator or you press and hold the home button, it will open recently used apps with a little image of that window. And in principle, that image might have a recognizable picture or a password or something you care about. 
So that is stored somewhere on the phone, but it turns out it's not stored on the storage, it's stored in the RAM. So you'd have to have root permissions on the phone to steal it. But anyway, some people get upset that that's stored and that's possibly a security vulnerability. Yeah. Well, apparently true. That was the article today. The password managers are actually storing your master password in plain text in RAM, which is kind of rude and unnecessary. Yeah. Yes, that's an issue. Yeah. Now, most people would say this. Is, yeah, that's true. So just to make it beautiful, they place some risk here. But the password manager just seems to be doing out of sloppiness. That's why I imagine now that it's hit the news, they'll probably patch that pretty fast. Because that the technical side of keeping something from persisting in RAM was solved 15 years ago by Microsoft and building Visual Studio. All they have to do is add like one, is define it as a different variable type in their code and recompile it, and that problem will be fixed. And all the browsers figured it out about five years ago. So I don't think it'll take long to patch that one. This one, I don't think they will patch because it is there for user convenience. It's like the thumbnails of images that you see in Windows. Those are also stored on a disk. And in principle, you can steal them and they might reveal something. But most people do appreciate being able to see a little picture of what they're trying to select. Yeah. Uh, well, you use a different variable type. I forget the name. But there's a type of variable called like a security editor or something in Windows, which only does not remember itself in RAM. It stays in RAM only while you're using it, and then erases it. So it doesn't persist. It does exist. It's been well known. It's a known type variable. So it's not, you don't have to do anything revolutionary. You just need to use a different variable type. You know, you got integers and floats, and there's something like a secure integer you should be using instead. Yeah. Are thumbnails persistent in Windows? Yes, they are. And they're also in, in the Mac. You'll find a thumbs.db file in every folder that has pictures, and that has those thumbnails. And you can steal them, and you can get them in forensics. That's how you get evidence. So they are persistent. You need them every time you open the folder. It needs to have those to display the little pictures. But in, on the phones, or in RAM. On the phone, apparently it's in RAM. Yeah, yeah. Although I've heard in iOS it's actually stored in the storage, but I haven't checked that because it's very hard to audit the storage of iOS. They encrypt it so much I can't see the storage. I have to use really old phones to examine the storage. That's why I keep saying iOS is more secure because I can't see inside it. But it turns out not to be true, as we we're just about to get to. Anyway, then there's something called fragment injection. You can send a fragment of data to a machine. And it turns out what you could do with this is you could um, send a fragment, which would cause it to change the operation of a, uh, an action. And you could open this activity to choose a new pin without passing the page that puts in your old pin. So I could change your pin without knowing your pin. So that amounts to pin bypass. Um, this we see a lot in web apps. We've talked about this. There's a lot of web app vulnerabilities where you have steps like choose a product, put in your address, put in your credit card number, buy it, and I can just skip that page where I put in the credit card number, do one, two, and four, and get the product without actually paying for it. This happens a lot. You can just skip over a step. All right, so I got a few cahoots about this, and that'll be the end of the textbook part of this lecture. So I've got this thing ready to go, and hopefully I've got the sound up. I do. All right. Good. I'll get a page up to store this information in. All right. And start that. All right. Hey, is that starting or what? There it goes. All right. This is CNET 128. All right. All right. Good. Good. All right, wait a few more seconds. See if we got any more comments. We do, okay. Just a minute. I'll try and make this go higher on the screen. If I can figure out how. There we are. 
that's probably as good as I can do it. Okay, five more seconds. Okay. All right. So what component was exported by default? Okay, content providers. Arguably not good because that's where you store the data. But anyway, that's the way it is. All right. Which module lists all exported components? Okay, that's attack servers. All right, what intent filter can match any part of the data? It's path. Okay, good. Most people got that. All right. What is the filter at the start? Like HTTPS. Okay, that's being good. Okay, so we should have some winners, and so we have Forrest. That's Carl, I bet. No, that's me. Okay, all right, good. Ed, right? Okay. Ed F, right? Yeah. Okay, and now I got pink. Who's pink? Okay, good. Um, all right. Um, all right, we'll get back to this. Um, uh, okay. All right, so I'm going to save this. All right, so now I'm going to uh, turn off the sharing and go to the part of this that is confidential. So you folks, I'll put this video up soon, but now I got the secret stuff. All right. And so while that's shutting down, I'm going to um,